So this is a talk that I've been working on now for uh, several months. And it's a topic that I think is quite important. But I still, I probably still haven't gotten it quite right. But I'm getting better at it each time, I think. And that is that basically Agile processes, or at least the name Agile processes, has gone way up that adoption curve. It's everywhere. But these projects bring around their own set of problems. And some of these problems come about, I think, because Agile, as it's generally practiced, is not very design-friendly. And uh, by that, I mean, I don't just mean that, uh, oh, people are so productive that they're not... uh, doing all these things. I mean, I think it actually has an element of anti-design in it. And I know the reason. Because I was there. I was there back in the time when Agile was kind of starting with extreme programming and all of that. And I remember that the years before that were full of these very heavy, elaborate, document-centric development processes where you would spend months and months on an analysis phase and then more months on a design phase. And you would write documents and write documents, which eventually, theoretically, were turned into programs. And this was awful. It was just awful, and it didn't work. And everyone knew it didn't work. And there was a revolution against that. And that's when extreme programming and Agile were born. And you know... Sometimes you need the revolution. Sometimes you need the blood in the streets and you have to chop off the aristocrats' heads. And then that generally leads to its own problems. And then eventually you realize that some of the institutions have to be rebuilt. And I think that's where we've come to now. You have to bring design back, but not like it was before, not heavy upfront design and analysis and lots and lots of documents. We have to find a way to do it that doesn't lose the benefits of Agile processes. And so that's what this talk is about, is how do you do that? And how do you do domain-driven design or other, probably this applies to other modeling approaches in that kind of uh, process. So let me start with some things that I hear people say fairly often. Sometimes people say, well, we should do a nice design, but we just don't have time. To me, this statement doesn't actually make sense. It it doesn't actually make sense unless design is a religion. Because the only reason that you aren't doing something that you should do is because doing it is virtuous. But you're trying to be practical right now, so you're not doing it. But design shouldn't be a religion. Design should be something we do because it gives us some specific benefit. And therefore, this statement does not make sense. If we should do a nice design that we should do it because it will help us get our job done. To say, I'm not going to do something that will help me get my job done because I don't have time doesn't really make sense. Now here's another sort of variation on the theme. And this one is one that I myself used to be somewhat sympathetic to. Modeling and design take extra time but they pay off in the long run. And I used to think that was the case, that the argument for modeling and design was you pay a certain price, but then you collect dividends. But I'm not so sure about that argument for design anymore, because it's speculative. It assumes that we kind of know what's going to happen in the future. And one of the insights that led to Agile was just how bad we are at predicting the future. 
We're really, really bad at predicting the future. We're really bad at knowing what we're going to need. And that was one of the key insights of Agile. You're not going to need it, they like to say. Right? They, I say they, but we like to say, because I'm a believer in Agile. So I don't think this is right. I don't think, rather, I think it could be right sometimes, but I don't think it's a good justification for doing design. I think that my justification is something more along the lines of this. Modeling and design are often the quickest path to the actual goal. And then the question becomes, what is the actual goal? So, the goal, I think, is very important to state because <clears throat> the way that a lot of Agile processes work is as if the goal were to implement a user story. Everything revolves around that and is optimized for that. And in fact, people are discouraged from thinking beyond this user story that they're working on. And if the goal were to deliver a user story, I would say that's, that's good. But is that the real goal? Maybe the goal is to complete a releasable set of stories. So this is a more plausible goal, right? Well, one's user story is probably not going to give us what we need. But if we could get a, a set of user stories with an acceptable level of bugs so that we can do a release, that's our goal. And even this goal might benefit from design. Because notice that bit about acceptable level of bugs. Right? You do one story, and someone does another story, and then you do another story, and there's not much coordination, and the fragmentation begins. And the way you solved this was a little improvisational, and the way they solved this is a little inconsistent, and it's hard to make everything consistent without some modeling work. Because that's kind of part of how we make things consistent, complex things. Even that might not be your actual goal. What if your goal is to deliver a release that the team can continue to extend in the next release? Our business model doesn't actually work if we just get the first release out. But we're, in, you know, we're intelligent, modern software people who know that you get a release out and you want to get a release out quick and then you get another release and another release. But that doesn't mean that you can succeed with just that first release. It may be useful, but it may not be sufficient to you. So getting to the end of that first release and then finding that you've made a big mess that you can't build on top of would not be the accomplishment of your actual goal. And yet, agile processes, as usually practiced, don't seem to have any provision for this. And they often lead people into this exact situation, and I've seen it often. They maintain a good velocity for a while. They get the first release out, and they realize that they're kind of stuck. Stuck in a mess that they just finished making, a legacy system that they put together in record time. So, another goal that you might have is to deliver a clear and cohesive user experience. So we make some great features that were expressed as user stories. We manage to get them out as a release. But people don't like the software because I'm doing this thing, and then I do that thing, and none of it makes sense together. I mean, every little thing I have to learn, and it's so awkward. A clear and cohesive user experience doesn't come from a bunch of people working independently on every uh, feature. So this feature, this extreme feature orientation of Agile processes, I think is one of its limitations. And, uh, but I don't think we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think we can keep a lot of what makes Agile so good. And a lot of what we got rid of in the revolution. But we have to just get a little beyond this. Okay. Now, before I go on too much further, I want to define a few terms. And one is the domain, because, of course, domain-driven design, most people here probably do know something about domain-driven design. 
But it's always worth just repeating these very basic definitions. The domain is not a layer of the software. It's not short for domain model. The domain is the thing that your software is about. And it's often something in the outside world or something, you know, real is a funny word. The domain isn't necessarily real. I mean, I don't know if finance is real, but a lot of people in this room work on financial applications. But the domain is something apart from the software. It's sort of a level down toward the concrete. Your, your model is a meta something of that domain. And that leads to what is the model? A model is not a UML diagram and some big fancy process around that. A model is a system of abstractions, a set of concepts. And it's presumably a set of concepts that is useful for addressing some particular need that you have regarding that domain. So there are lots and lots of possible models of any given domain. And that's very important to being able to succeed with this. And the choice of our model is largely dictated by what we're trying to do, what problem we're trying to solve. So another way of looking at model is that it's a sort of distilled form of knowledge about the domain. Now, here's another one of those statements that I've heard all too many times. We have to get the model right first before we write the code. So here is a kind of assumption that people still make, even today, which is one of the reasons for the agile, the apparent agile modeling conflict. If this were true, then, it, then modeling would surely not fit very well into agile. But to me, this is a total non sequitur. Getting the model right and uh, does not involve doing it before you start coding. Why? Well, we just talked about how models are a distilled form of knowledge about the domain. Now, if you consider when do you know the very least about the domain that you will ever know, it is at the beginning of the project. In fact, software projects are incredible learning experiences where we learn a tremendous amount about the domain and about what our needs within that domain are. And those are exactly the things we need in order to come up with good models. So the best model you're going to come up with is actually the one you come up with on the last day of the project. And although it might be a bit too much to hope that you could actually build the software around that model, Certainly, we don't want to choose the exact opposite of that. So upfront design locks in ignorance. It locks in the ignorance that you have on the first day of the project and keeps it fresh throughout. We'll make sure that <laughs> we don't want to do that. All right. So basically, Agile and domain-driven design kind of need each other. You know, the domain-driven design addresses, for example, the distraction that technology can, can bring. Although, Agile's pretty good at avoiding this one, too. Feature orientation that fragments the experience of the user and the ability to build software on top of other software that's something that domain-driven design can bring. And this tendency to lock in the ignorance from upfront design is something that Agile can help with. Because Agile is all about being able to change late in the game. That's why it's called Agile. It's not called Agile because, you know, it's a way of organizing the backlog or something. The idea is that you're able to quickly respond to whatever reason there is to change direction. 
one reason to change direction might be that you would say, ah, now I understand what I need to understand in order to make a good model, but I need to do something with that. All right. Now I want to show a little video. It's just a very, very short video. And in this video, we're going to see an example of people doing domain-driven design, you might say. In principle, 100,060, making the principle on the first, 100,080.01. OK. Except this number isn't the balance on that day. The balance is still 90,000 something. This number is the principal according to the negotiated contract. Okay, now here we see a lot of things that are associated with domain driven design. They're very undramatic, but very important. So, walking through concrete reference scenarios is fundamental because if you're doing something like modeling, which is extremely abstract, you need to be anchored in the concrete. You need to be also focused very much on what you're trying to accomplish. So a concrete scenario, such as the one he was going through with this example of a very specific calculation. I do this, I do this, I do this. Oops. Creative collaboration with a domain practitioner. He's there together with a business person and they're working through this problem together. That's an essential part of domain driven design. And refinement of the ubiquitous language. Now, most of you probably know the term ubiquitous language, but just in case, ubiquitous language is one of the most basic concepts in domain-driven design. It says that a lot of what we're doing as we work on one of these projects is that we're cultivating a very precise language. It's a kind of creation that we make along with the business people that is precise enough to support software development and yet clear in terms of the business enough for domain experts to actually talk to us with this language. So we would speak in the same way if we were talking to one of our business stakeholders, if we were talking to another one of our developers, or if we were talking to the computer, so to speak, by writing code. That's the ubiquitous language. So at the moment when she came up and said, the calculation looks right, but that number that you called the balance isn't really the balance. That's the principle according to the contract or something like that. That was a modeling moment. She was correcting his, or she was changing the ubiquitous language. She was saying, we're not calling this the right thing. This number is right, but the concept behind it isn't balance. The concept behind it is this other thing we call principle. That's modeling just as much as if we had some UML boxes on the wall. And he can do the same things. I mean, later that day, he might be using a refactoring tool to do a rename. Or it might be a little more subtle than that, because he may have mixed these two concepts together. You may have to pry apart that, that class or something. Things are going pretty well here. They are collaborating smoothly, so smoothly that you don't really even realize that they're doing a modeling exercise. So things aren't always that easy. It goes through each asset and calculates the interest due on that date. Mm -hmm. And the asset, in turn, uses the interest calculator figured out. Um, then it passes the resulting amounts and an account name to the accounting service. I assume that's when money start posted to the ledger. Right. For now, I think we have a handle on the different cases themselves and the calculations, but it's all these special cases when they don't pay the interest on schedule. Oh, those aren't really special cases. There's a lot of flexibility built into the payment dates. I and know. And besides, 
we're already holding back more cases. I know, I know. Okay. Now, uh, you don't need to know about Money Star and all that, whatever it was they were talking about. But think about what, what did she say that might have alerted you if you were thinking about modeling. And there was one phrase that caught my ear. She said, those aren't special cases, right? And so the question is, what is a special case? Special case is an important word, I think. Well, one usage of special case would be, most of the time it's like this, but sometimes it's like this. So it could be that these are just cases which are not as frequent as other cases. But when we're talking about modeling and building software, and after all, in a software system, the frequency might affect some performance considerations, but it doesn't affect the actual development of the logic very much. It takes just as long to develop something that will be used once a day as it does to make something that will be used once every tenth of a second. So, special case in this means that kind of the flow of logic that is straightforward within our model is, you know, everything works nicely. When you have to do something that doesn't flow nicely through the model, that's a special case. And we're prepared for it with if, then, else logic, or exception handling logic, or all kinds of ways we have of dealing with special cases. And if there are not very many of them, if what we've found is a model that kind of hits the sweet spot so that most of the complicated things we have to do flow smoothly, that is, are straightforward to explain, simple to calculate, we're in good shape. And what he's saying is that the cases that don't fall into that category are mounting. Now, let's take a look at one of those special cases. Okay. Um, well, what we've been doing is because we have the payment history, mm -hmm. when we calculate the interest, we take the balance I guess you would, take, you would call it the actual balance. And we look up all the early payments. OK. And then add them back to get the principal amount and use that to calculate the interest. OK. I guess you'd end up with the right number that way. OK. <laughs> Green bar. Now here's a place where domain-driven design and the common practices of Agile would part ways a little bit. Because in the strictest expression of test-driven development, you state what the correct answer is, and you make the test pass. Now it doesn't sound like his software is overwhelmingly complex. It's not a it's not going to make all kinds of smells that would lead to you to refactor. The only thing that's happening is that when you explain how it works to a business person, they follow you, but they think it's weird. But this isn't good in domain-driven design. In domain-driven design, we want that collaborator. That means we want to find a solution that's not only going to give us the right answer, but that's going to do it in a way that seems natural to the business people that we can really talk to them about. So at this point, we have a little bit of concern. Now, that was the sort of early payment case, which he calls a special case, and she does not. And now let's look at the late payment case. But you said something about late payments. Yeah. Say the payment comes in on June 2nd. I'd have to adjust the principal number so that what we've been doing is we generate a fake payment for June 1st and a new delta. 
so that we can send the special delta. Special delta? Yeah, the scheduled principal delta. And since the fee calculator knows when the payments are due, so that it can calculate the fees. OK. So this is, you know, wheels within wheels. And how often has that happened to you? You go down a path. The first case you do, straightforward. Everything works very elegantly. Maybe then you have a case or two where, well, it's a, maybe a little awkward, but it still works. And then all of a sudden, you're deep in the woods. And at this point, we would say that the model that is the basis for this calculation is not helping at all. In fact, if anything, it's getting in the way. Because this model assumes that there's always a payment at a certain point in time. I think it does make that assumption. Why do I think that? Because he had to put a fake payment there. He had to do that to satisfy an assumption in the model, an assumption that just simply doesn't apply to the business. How many of you have encountered fake something or dummy something or sometimes it's called temp? <laughs> Okay, how many of you have created one of these? <laughs> it's confession time. Now, I have. I've done all these things. And almost anything is justifiable in certain kinds of, you know, moments. I mean, I wouldn't say those were the moments in which I did it. I, I'll confess to that, too. But, you know, your, <clears throat> your release is in a couple of days and uh, et cetera, et cetera to put some really awful thing in there and then sort it out next week is one thing, right? But just to say, well, if I do this, I get my story done, and now it's on to the next story. That's, that's different. OK. At this point, it's really time to challenge your assumptions and look for a quite different model and, it, and put the effort in to make a model that will actually help development. This is the point at which I was saying that we aren't modeling because it's the right thing to do, because it's somehow good. You know, that's the religious argument. We're modeling because we're in a situation like this, where every new feature is excruciatingly difficult to implement and get bug-free and get consistent with the other features. It's time to say, if we thought about this problem a different way, if we had a different system of abstractions, maybe this could be more simple and, and consistent and clear. Maybe the domain expert wouldn't be you know, shuffling our papers when I explain it. In fact, I, I notice even a different reaction. And we mentioned fake payment. Accountants don't like words like fake payment, I've found. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm going to suggest that we shift our way of thinking about design from push to pull. And now let me s explain what I mean by that. Have any of you been exposed to what's uh, sort of uh, lean development and that whole concept? It's kind of a kind of a cousin to Agile. And <clears throat> Lean Design basically says that you, um, you know, it's, it's kind of related to the just-in-time manufacturing and all that. You don't do something until you actually need it. You don't want a lot of stuff sitting around that you'll use eventually. You want to just, and that would apply to everything, including design. You design when you realize that you need to design or model. So, in this case, we definitely need to model. Now, I think we needed to model in the earlier one, where they were just at the point where she said, well, I guess you'd get the right answer that way. It probably would have been cheaper, and it would have, you know, it's like the usual trade-off between refactor now or refactor later. But 
I don't expect we'll always detect it at that first opportunity. Often we'll detect it when we are deep in the wood. And it's time to really challenge our assumptions and, and go back to ground. <clears throat> we should be watching for these cases. When communication with the stakeholders is deteriorating, when the solutions actually seem out of proportion to the problem itself, I mean, you had what seemed like a straightforward problem, and the solution is very complex. And it's not because halfway through you said, oh yeah, this problem is way more complex than we thought, which that happens. That's one of those unknowns that Agile sort of is focused on. But it's not that kind. It's the kind where even after you've done it, you say, that thing just shouldn't be that complex, right? That means your model doesn't fit the problem very well. When your velocity is slowing down because the previous work is a burden on new work. Now, it's gotten to the point where most people have never experienced a project where per earlier work was actually a, an asset to new work, where earlier work accelerated the new work. It's sad to me, because I've been on a few of those projects, and most of them were a long time ago, but that's what good modeling can give you the old work actually makes the new work go faster because you're building on abstractions that you've created that let you work at a higher level or you know you've gotten a lot of the ground work out of the way now and that still happens some so all these are reasons that it's time to model and that the shortest path from where you are now to where you need to go is probably through modeling not through just continuing to grind away. The, a metaphor that has come to my mind recently is a bee in a window. You know, you see a bee that got in the house, it's trying to get out of the house, it goes up against the window, the window's open like this much. But the bee's up here and it just keeps bumping against the glass over and over and over and over. And it might go a little up and a little down and a little left and a little right and you watch it and you think, you know, if only it would just go down like, but it doesn't. It's thinking, out is that way. I don't want to go that way. That's not out. <laughs> it's thinking. Now, I think sort of relative to the complexity of, you know, a bee brain, that problem's probably about as hard as a typical software project is for our brain. <laughs> and we get in these situations, you know. We are metaphorically bumping up against an obstacle. It's not a physical obstacle. And we are very reluctant to take a step backward because it seems like that will lose time. But it's actually not necessarily the slowest way to get there. Sometimes, you know, the bee in the window is a case where no matter how long it keeps bumping against the window, it'll never get through it. Maybe the metaphor I should use is that I want to get to that door over there. And so the most straightforward way for me to go is that way. But the, the table is in the way. Now I could just climb up onto this table, you know, and I could go over that, and then I'm going to have to go over you in a minute, so be prepared. And I could get to the door that way with a few bruises and, you know, maybe a couple of people mad at me. I think it would be faster if I walk over here. And now I've got a straight shot at the door. I think that would be faster. And that's the way it is often on these software projects. But Agile is very, very focused. It's very much like that bee. It's got an algorithm. You go in small steps around where you are. And that's all you do. OK, so we've decided it's time to pull the design. It's time to say, let's challenge our assumptions. So what do we actually do? Here's a thing which. In a certain sense, I wrote a book about, you know, well, you do what's in that book. Except I was deliberately, I avoided being very prescriptive about process. I was careful not to talk much about what steps you should actually take 
because I thought there will be a multitude of processes that, and I, I think that could work just fine. And I still think that. Nonetheless, what I noticed over the years since the book is that when I'm working with clients, we actually do a fairly consistent thing. We actually tend to do this. Uh, we have a process, really. And so we started to get methodical about it, kind of write, even write it down a bit. And so I want to describe that to you briefly tonight. And here's a picture of the process. You know how the waterfall describes the process where you start out by doing analysis and then you do design and then you do coding and, you know, all that. And uh, since violent water metaphors have proven so catchy, I'm thinking of calling this the whirlpool. <laughs> because it's kind of like that. You get to this point where you say it's time to model. Our model isn't working for us. We need to model. So you jump into the whirlpool. You, you swirl around in the whirlpool for a while and eventually climb back out. Okay, so where does it start? Well, kind of, it could start almost anywhere, but let's say it starts over here with a scenario. So the scenario, remember, is a very concrete description of some sequence of business events and computations that leads to some solution of some problem and through and beyond it. And so we've got one of those. And right now, we, we go to the modeling phase then. And in the modeling, we do this kind of over and over and over and over and over. Propose a model. Well, we've already got one model. We'll start maybe by walking through it with that model. And so we'll walk through, you know, the states at each point in the story in that scenario, walk through the solution that we have, do the computation. We saw him doing this, right? And as we do it, we'll find their very awkward points and explore the language. We saw them doing that a bit. And now, at any point, we propose a new model. OK, it was so terribly awkward that way. Here's a new idea. What if we had, so we don't want to have to put a fake payment in there. So what if we modeled it like this in a way that doesn't make that assumption? Let's walk through the states again. Let's do the solution again. Oh, that doesn't work. We get to this point, and we don't have a way to solve it. OK, another idea. Propose another model. All right, and we start walking through the states again. Well, we get through that one, but it's almost as maybe even more awkward than the original one. OK, propose another model. The lucky thing about models is that there's no particularly finite number of them. They're just things we make up, and you can make up a lot if you're willing to make mistakes. So that's an actual important step and an important ingredient in this process. You make mistakes. This is one of the things which I think is missing from almost all the development projects that I've encountered. People try to avoid making mistakes. It sounds good. I'm going to avoid making mistakes. But it, 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 it isn't always good. And this is one of those times when it's actually not good. So let's say that you were, you know, in a design set, in a modeling session, and you didn't want to make a mistake. You didn't want to say something foolish. Well, one way, the best way of doing that, apart from just saying nothing at all, but let's assume that, you know, that would look bad too. The best way is to suggest a very small change to the existing model. Just a very incremental change. Usually when you do that, you can suggest something that is a little bit better. And you might say, well, a little bit better, and then if I made it a little bit better still, and a little bit better still, and a little bit better still, eventually I might get to a good solution. Sometimes that works but not necessarily when you're in the be at the window situation, right? Because you don't know that your little bit betters are working you toward the open window. If you knew that, you would just go straight to the open window, right? You don't know. So you're going a little this way and a little that way, and you watch the bee, 
And it is. It's just moving around a little bit at a time in random directions. Actually, sometimes they do get out because they'll eventually, you know, random walk can take you a long way. But of course, our projects, I mean, remember, we're burning money every step of the way, or sometimes more importantly, time. So you don't necessarily want to take the time, right, that it takes to just randomly in tiny little steps to get there. And there is another way, which is just take bigger steps. Now, if you were, most of those will be completely wrong. Most of those will be bad ideas. The, the thing then that you have to do is explore them in very, very cheap ways. First, by just walking through. On a whiteboard, you're just walking through the, mo uh, the, the scenario. That's very, very cheap. And you try some wild idea, and you walk through and say, oh, that, was, that doesn't work at all. Then you try another one. And that one doesn't work either, but, oh, it really does get rid of the fake payment. And someone says, you know, but if we just took this part of that idea and then combined it with that original idea or this other idea that I just had, which was triggered by seeing your silly idea, and so on. And at some point, you may say, ah, this one really solves that scenario nicely. What do we do next? Well, we challenge the model with a new scenario. Probably one we've already got on the shelf. Remember, there's, we've seen already at least three scenarios that they go through, right? We want to make sure that this model deals at least with those three rather nicely. And maybe when you challenge the model with one of the other scenarios, you say, oh, well, we managed to make something that handles late payments elegantly, but now on-time payments are a mess. That wouldn't be a good solution either. So fortunately, there are lots and lots of models where that one came from, so we just come up with another one, and we go round, round, round. For an hour, for an hour and a half, and if we haven't got something interesting by then, let's just leave it to another day. We can go back to our be at the window style for another day, or our climb over the table style for another day, Maybe a new idea will come to us. But maybe we find something that does seem to work. Now, then we look at this thing and say, this seems to solve our most important scenarios reasonably well. Some of them are very elegant. Some of them are mm, not elegant, but they're not a terrible mess like they were before. What do we do next? Well, maybe we look at this and say, you know, we could refactor to this in a matter of a couple of days, in which case, fine, just go for it. But maybe we look at it and say, hmm, this looks a little scary. It's like I'm not sure I could foresee the consequences of refactoring this way. I think it might cause problems in some other system, or it might be more difficult to change than it looks. Let's do a code probe. Now, this is what I call where we say, now, there's all kinds of ways of going about code pro, but one way would be I want to find out how hard it is to change the system in this way. So I'm going to make a branch, and a pair is going to take that branch, and they're going to work on it for maximum two days. And their mission is to get this thing fully refactored, but don't be too careful. They're going to make a terrible mess along the way. They're going to do everything that you wouldn't do under normal circumstances. They'll cut corners in things that are not considered risky. Because we've said at the beginning, and we will stick to it, we are not ever going to merge this branch. This is a throwaway exercise. Now, from all this stuff about making mistakes over here and throwing away branches over there, you're probably getting the message that I think that you need a lot of experimentation, a lot of kind of trial stuff, but in forms that are cheap, forms that are a lot cheaper anyway than refactoring an entire system around a fundamentally different model. Another thing that happens in code probes is that you say, all right, I want to see if this logic really holds together. I, I know it holds together on a whiteboard, but you know how slippery whiteboards can be. So I'm going 
to, I want to write code that proves that it works. Now, writing a whole layered architecture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a real working application is hopelessly expensive as a way to test a modeling idea. So what we do instead, we use a test framework like, you know, JUnit or something. And we'll write our scenario as a test. And then the, uh, and then we'll write some POJOs, or, you know, POCOs for the C-sharp people. And just show that the logic actually works. Yes, you can do this computation. Yes, you can go through all three of these scenarios. You get the right answer. It makes sense. You don't discover, oh, yeah, there's that. That doesn't actually work. And we get back to here, and we're at a decision point. Maybe we challenge with another scenario. Maybe we discovered the model didn't work, in which case we're back out of the pool and we're back to, you know, let's just tr trudge ahead. Or maybe we say, this thing works. It actually solves the problem. We know we could actually refactor it. In fact, the scout team has gone ahead and found the danger points. And they say, look, most of it's really easy, but there's going to be this, and this is going to be hard. We didn't get it completely solved. But we think we know the parameters of the problem, so now we can make a really accurate estimate. So, now we know, okay, we've got a model that we like, that really we think would get us out of our bind. We know the uh, scope of changing it to that other thing. Remember, we haven't spent much on this, right? We've spent some hours of model brainstorming, some maybe a couple of days of a pair doing that code probe, but we're still in the really small expenditures category. But also, we haven't made any decisions yet. One thing that is very important to making this work is to really distinctly separate decision making from exploring. So, you, that's one reason I say no matter what you do, we will throw away that code. Oh, I don't want them to be too careful. And it's a reason that, um, that I say, you know, make lots of mistakes. There's no need to have every stakeholder in the room all the time. If you say, we're not making any decisions in this meeting. At best, what we'll end up with is this new model and some fairly accurate estimate of what it would take to refactor the system to that new model. And then we can decide. Then we can make sure all the stakeholders are there. And we're not just shooting in the dark. We're not just hoping. We are actually making a decision based on quite a bit of information. And this is what we tend to do. So I said, well, it's not the only way to do this, I'm sure. It's the way we do it. And it may be useful to other people. And it proves that, it, you know, that there is a way to systematize this. If you want to get that picture or if you want to read a very rough, very rough draft of my write-up of this process, you could go to this URL here and uh, you can download it. And in future, as future drafts are available, they'll also be at this URL. And when there's finally a kind of a version 1.0 that's really ready for the big time, then, then it'll be announced in the newsletter, which you can also sign up for at that same place. Okay. I'll put that back up later if you need it. Now, we've talked about polling you know, pulling design, as in we're at a certain point and we know from observing that our communication with domain experts is deteriorating or that it's getting very, very hard to build new stuff or our solutions are so awkward even though our problem seems simple. And then we talked about how to actually maybe do the, explora the exploration and finding a new model and kind of proving it out and assessing how expensive it would be to actually implement it and so forth. Now, where does it fit in to the Agile process? Where do you put it? So, there are actually a number of mechanisms within Agile that are 
kind of good hooks for this kind of stuff. Um, for example, stand-up meetings. Stand-up meetings are supposed to be, for example, a place where you can tell people that you're blocked. And usually that means I'm blocked because I need this from somebody and I don't have it, or whatever reason. But another reason is, hey, I've recognized a modeling problem. I've recognized that this story, which should be a fairly straightforward story, is really complicated because the model just doesn't fit. And I think this is something that needs to come to team level attention. Because uh, sometimes, you know, you can fit it within the normal activities, like in that first one where the guy said balance and the domain expert corrected him and said principle. But, but when it gets big, like this fake payment situation, when you're thinking of jumping into the whirlpool, you probably want to bring it to team level. And the stand-up meeting is all you need for that. But you're not going to go into a big, complicated design session there. You're just going to make everyone aware that there's an issue here. And people might say, you know what? Release this tomorrow. We're not going to do this now. <laughs> but they might say, you know, but hey, next week we really should. Spike. Most Agile processes have something they call a spike. People don't use them enough, in my opinion. It's a great technique. It's exactly what I described. You've got something that you can't foresee the cost of or the outcome of. And you want to know, you want to assess, will it really work? How much will it cost to change it like this? But you don't want to do this just by doing it. You have a spike. Let's try it. Let's try it in an isolated branch with a very tightly boxed, uh, time boxed effort. Spike is a great way to explore things. You, can, you could view this whole modeling Whirlpool episode as a spike, but I wouldn't really, because it's so small in scope, you know, it's just going into a room for a couple of hours. But the actual code probe part, I think spikes are great techniques for that. Iteration zero. Now that one is a little more controversial, and it's usually talked about as a way of kind of getting, you know, shake out this sort of shakeout crews <coughs> and getting the process working, maybe some architectural things. And although, you know, I, I emphasized that we do not want the model that you came up with on the first day of the project. That is going to be the worst model you ever come up with. Well, it won't be because you'll come up with some real doozies if you do this exploration thing the way I think you should. But it will be the first one, it will be the worst one that you would actually consider adopting. And so I wouldn't want a system built around it and yet you need something to start with. If you're going to send a bunch of pairs off working on a bunch of stories, you want those things to be somewhat cohesive. You want it to be around some model. So a little investment up front. How much investment? I don't know. A couple days? I'm not talking months. I'm talking something on the order of a couple of days. But a couple of days of kickoff gives, gets people on the same page. Knowing that the model you come up with is going to be very naive. That you're going to want to replace this within weeks. And you will. <coughs> Release planning. Release planning is where you think a little bigger than a story. It's the one time in the Agile process where you do really take a step back and you say, what are, where are we trying to get to? Of course, you don't do it in great detail and you do it with recognition that you can't predict scope way out there. But it does give you a point at which you can see, in order to get to there, this problem which has been dragging us down in our stories, the problem that he talked about maybe at the stand-up last week, this thing needs to be addressed. It's not keeping us from getting stories done, but it, it'll probably keep us from getting this release done. So, and there are some others, but if you start looking at the 
toolbox you've got with Agile, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff in there that we don't use very much or that isn't used very creatively. And I think people have almost gotten in a rut. All right, back to defining terms. There's one other domain-driven design term that I think is really critical to success. And it's sort of almost the most exotic of them, but I, and I wish, I wish that I had not put this in chapter 14. Nonetheless, bounded context. I think that a lot of things that go wrong when people attempt to do modeling, whether it's with Agile or without Agile, come about because they're not thinking about bounded context. And there's not enough time in this talk to, uh, to try to uh, explain it fully. But just think about it. Well, here's the definition as written. A description of a boundary is typically a subsystem boundary or the work of a particular team within which a particular model is defined and applicable. A particular model, which of course in DDD terms also means a particular language. So if I say a certain word, within this context it means a, a certain thing, but over in that other context it might mean something different. So here we have a subsystem and it's got something called a customer and our team works on that and we know what customer means. And over here is another subsystem and a different team works on it, and they have a customer too. And then you know, if you looked at all closely, you'd probably find that, oh, their customer isn't quite like our customer. And these things go in steps to the point where you can have drastic kind of collisions. And if you're not being conscious of it, these mixed together, pretty soon you've got a muddle it's perfectly fine that there are two definitions of customer in these two systems. The trouble comes if you start mixing things willy-nilly. This has an impact especially with um, Agile because you need that clarity in order to do modeling. You need to have a context in which you really can define terms clearly and know that it means one thing. When I say customer, it means just one thing that we've all agreed on. Otherwise, you know, the, the subtle techniques just don't work. It's not just DDD. I think for any sophisticated design te technique to work, you really need a clear, bounded context. But in um, Agile, there's usually the concept of shared cone ownership. Shared code ownership is a, is a great uh, princi principle. You know, a, a lot of people may not remember what came before shared code ownership, but I remember owning specific classes. And only I could check things in. But if I wanted to change anything on any other class, someone else had to do it. And uh, it was just a terrible, you know, it was a terrible impediment to... Uh, to my own getting my job done, but also any kind of real collaboration just gets stunted. Your view gets so tiny, even smaller than story orientation, really. So, it was good. But, suppose you've got kind of a big team or multiple teams, and they're working on a system that is a little too big for people to understand all of it very well. So, you're working on your thing, and you go over here, and you know part of your thing is related to that thing over there, where you don't work very often. So that you go over there, because the idea is that you complete your whole story, right? That's the agile ideal, that once you get this story, you do everything that's needed to complete it. Which means you go blundering through this part of the system that you don't really understand, changing it in ways that make your story work, but without really understanding fully the motivation for why it was the way it was. And this is where I say that what we should be sharing, the, the shared code ownership should be within one bounded context. So I'm going to assume that if we define a bounded context, that everyone who works in that bounded context is part of the same team. And that 
we've applied all those agile principles that help a team coordinate and keep the same concepts in their mind. Maybe they're together in one room. Maybe they're doing continuous integration. Well, I say, wouldn't say maybe about that one. I would say <laughs> I wouldn't deign to call it agile if it didn't have continuous integration. So they've, they're doing continuous integration. They're in the same room together. They're doing all these things. In that kind of environment, you can get away with reaching over there, working on that thing. That person sitting right over there, if you really don't feel confident, you can just say, hey, I'm working on your thing. Is there anything I ought to know before I do this? Or maybe you could just come pair with me for a little while. And all kinds of things. Or if I make a little mistake, probably at the continuous integration point, something will happen. And then I really ought to say to that guy, hey, you know, I just broke something. Maybe we'd better talk about this. And you start to understand and you fix it. But if those people are in another room, another team, you may not even know the person. And yet I see projects where in the idea of, because they pursue this principle of shared code ownership, they think it should apply to all the code in the whole system. And that undermines effective modeling and design. Because it means that if you do something the least bit subtle, it means that person from over there is not going to immediately understand it. Everyone on your team may, because you may have told them about it. But that guy over there isn't going to. He's just going to blunder in. So all the code has to kind of be dumbed down to a point where nothing anyone does will break anything. And that really means that objects are just data holders and all the logic moves somewhere else, somewhere probably you kind of own. Not officially, but de facto. Some little transaction script that you wrote and nobody else messes with because it's, you know, just for your story. All right. Just a couple more points that I need to make in order to bring this whole picture together. When we get into this, it's going to be very important to remember that not all of a large system will be well designed. And so we really have to focus. It's very easy to get too idealistic. Some of the Agile principles are too idealistic. For example, this notion that some, at least some Agile processes have extreme programming had of this kind of relentless refactoring. If there's a smell in the code, you refactor and you get rid of it. Now, nobody ever actually did this. Well, some projects probably did, but I mean, for the most part, Agile projects don't do this, but that's the way it describes it nonetheless. This is too idealistic. It means that you're expending a lot of effort in places where it's just not going to pay off. It's really a push. Right? That's a push model because you're not, yeah, I mean the smell, okay, but really it's not causing you a problem yet. You need, if you're going to do some kind of modeling, design, maybe it's in an area of the system where there's frequent change, not where we speculate that there will be frequent change. That's not the Agile way. Where we know there's frequent change because we've had it again and again. Every time I get another story, it's another change to this part of the system. And after you've done a few of those, it's worth saying, let's make that part of the system a little more flexible. And that usually means some kind of crafting the model a bit. And in that part of the system, it's worth keeping it super clean, doing some careful modeling. But not in the other part that, well, I did that in one story, and I've never gone back to that code. Seems to be fine. An area of development that is strategically important. This is something that I've done entire talks about, and I won't try to go into it now, but it's really important to recognize that some things are just to make a feature work, and some things are like pivotal to making your company's business plan work. And the, you need to know which is which. The user experience is losing coherence. It could be that that part of the system works just fine, and that part of the system works just fine too. But they work in such different ways that it's really jarring to a user. And even though there aren't even any code smells, that you still might have to do some modeling just to bring them together, if this turns out to be important. 
Now, people know what a big ball of mud is? One of the nice things about this bounded context concept is that we can say, look, here's a context within which there essentially are no rules. In this context, and by the way, this is probably what most software development contexts are like, in this context, you just make it work. And everything is connected to everything. This was beautifully described in a pattern called the big ball of mud, which I urge everyone to Google for and read. It's a great pattern. Now, the big ball of mud is very common, and you've probably got one. I mean, not necessarily what you're working on, but I mean somewhere within the larger system that you're working within, it's probably some big ball of mud, an old legacy system that nobody really likes to touch too much, and maybe you've set up a wall around it. And you're, you talk to it through this translation, and that's what's allowed you to do some nice work. This is a separation between that context and your context. In your context, a word has one specific meaning. In a big ball of mud, a word can have lots of meanings. In your context, rules are very explicit and clear. In a big ball of mud, you've got this improvised set of rules that probably are not consistent, but that if you just don't move anything, if you just stand very still, it will actually all work. And so be very aware of the bounded context, and then do some triage. Realize that within the big ball of mud, there is just no point to investing in modeling and design. It just will not pay off because, first of all, it's terribly difficult because everything is coupled to everything. So it's very difficult to, to even bring about such a thing. And secondly, because that's the rules of the game within there. Everybody's playing with those, by those rules. In a week, you come back and your thing that you so carefully crafted will be tied to something else in ways that just completely blow away all that careful decoupling. So just don't waste your time there. If you're not in the right kind of context, don't try to apply sophisticated design. Also, this is kind of a repeat of the previous screen, but sometimes a transaction script is a fine solution, a tidy transaction <laughs> script. So, so if you are finding that things are working, remember we're going to pull regarding design. We're not going to push. Just leave well enough alone sometimes. All right. Just to recap then. I think that one thing we need to do is explore a lot more, be much more experimental, and do this in very cheap ways. My suggestions about this be that whirlpool process that I described. And section three in the DDD book, in my book, also talks a lot about what this exploration is like. So that's one ingredient. Context boundaries. You must map out the ones that are already there. And then if you don't have a context within which nice modeling and design are viable, then think about bringing one into existence. There are various techniques for doing that. Some of them are described in the book. Don't just say, well, I'm going to do some good design because I'm supposed to do design and I'm in a ball of mud, but I'm not going to even worry about that. Don't do that. If you're really in a ball of mud and if you really don't have an option to somehow carve out another context, the modeling isn't going to pay off, and you should play by the rules of that game. Distilling the core domain is another strategic principle. It's part of what I was talking about, about saying doing something that is really critical to the organization's success. But it's just completely out of the scope of, you know, uh, now a 70-minute talk, so 
I'm going to just say, now it is talked about in chapter 15. Somehow I put all this stuff back there. Then we talk about triggers to pull design when we need it, right? Start, start paying attention. At first, don't even worry about taking action. Just start paying attention. What is it that's, you know, is this happening? Do you see that you describe how something works in the system and the business people sort of, they don't follow you, but they're satisfied that you're getting the right answer, so they leave you alone. Well, okay. That's, that's an indication there, right? Or watch for this. You know, you get to the end of working on a story and you say, oh my God, that thing is complicated. And you look at the story and you say, that's not that complicated. You know, why, why did this become this? You know, this Rube, Gold, this Rube Goldberg contraption that I ended up building just to do this simple thing. Did I really need to? These are the kinds of things that make me want to do some modeling.